Okay, there's just a few more comments on protein that I wanted to make that I, you know, didn't have and I didn't get into the book. You know, some of the stuff came along later. All right, so let me just try to grab this thing here and I'll show you how this works. So one of the things that comes up, a lot of people are concerned about, are they protein deficient? And I would say never worry about that. Uh, the only time when that would become relevant is if you have a large open wound that you're trying to heal after you've been NPO nothing by mouth for a couple days. All right, other than that, forget about it, okay? You're going to get enough protein. And this has been figured out a long time ago. Pritikin figured this out. There were papers that showed you could feed people controlled diets with only 2.5% of calories from protein, and they would do quite well. The average vegan diet, low-fat vegan diet, is about 80-10-10. 80% 10, 10. 80 carbohydrate, 10% fat, 10% uh, calories from protein. Um, and another thing too I would talk about is, uh, you know, there's a saying in medicine, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses and horses in terms of being common things, common diseases all day long, every day, nonstop. I expect every patient to be fat, have a fatty liver, diabetes or prediabetes, be hypertensive, have coronary artery disease, perhaps, you know, additional coronary artery disease related things, previous MI, AFib, stents, cabbage, you know, coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Um, lots of them have cancer, you know, prostate cancer or other minor cancer, sometimes like thyroid or some other stuff. Um, kidney stones and failure, mild kidney failure is very common. Kidney stones are not quite as common, but they're still common. Okay, cognitive impairment, strokes, all this stuff I see all day long. They're all associated with excess animal protein diets, okay? Um, then the next thing, you know, when you hear, hoof, when you hear hoof beats, you don't want to think of a rare thing like a zebra, but you do sometimes see a zebra in medicine. So zebras are diseases that are less common, but they still occur enough that you should know about them. And that's like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, lupus, autoimmune disorder, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis. I actually see a lot of MS. I see a lot of patients worked up for Parkinson's. Um, not that often do they have anything on their imaging findings. MS, I see lots of MS, but just because as a neuroradiologist, as a specialist, they all get referred for MRI. But still, for every MS patient, I see at least 100 garden variety atherosclerosis type demented patients from neurovascular uncoupling, you know, mouse equivalents, the deletory theory and all that. Okay, the next thing is after you hear hoofbeats, you know, what's even more rare to see? Stuff like ALS and pheochromocytoma. ALS is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, super rare. I'm a neuroradiologist. It's one of the common things that I do. I see an ALS case about once every five years. That's how rare it is on a brain MRI. Pheochromocytoma, everybody talks about that in conference. You almost never see it. I see about one pheo. It's a catecholamine secreting uh, adrenal gland tumor that causes hypertension, okay? I see about one of those every 15 years. That's how rare it is. Okay, then what about um, the unicorn? So a unicorn is so rare that it doesn't exist. And that's protein deficiency. I've never, I've been a doctor over 30 years. I never once seen a single case of protein deficiency. Uh, Dr. McDougall gave a lecture recently. He's never seen a case of protein deficiency. Those quasi orker babies, you know, with the big gut belly sticking out, they're starving, okay? They have a food caloric deficiency, not a protein deficiency. And addition ways that this has been shown and proved is look at Kempner's diet. He was feeding about 4.4% of calories from protein. His patients were doing great curing all kinds of diseases. Look at the Papua New Guinea uh, population eating 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes, which has 4.5% of its calories from protein. They're these energetic muscle men, okay? Um, so forget about that. And the controlled population diets, like I said, they could feed them 2.5% of their calories from protein. Pritikin showed this, and the people would do really well. Average plant-based diet, vegan diet, low-fat vegan diet, it's about 80-10-10 in the caloric distribution with 80% from uh, carbohydrates, 10% from fat, 10% from protein. Okay, um, um, and human breast milk, Dr. McDougall's talk about this. If you've got, typically it's got five to six percent of calories from uh, protein, and basically that's the most rapid phase of growth in life. You know, you're going to need less than that the whole rest of your life, so I wouldn't worry about it. There's no naturally chosen diet where you're going to get your, your percent of uh, calories from protein below you know three or four percent, so I would just Forget about it. It's not an issue. Okay. They always try to tell people, oh, you're protein deficient. You old people, you're going to be sarcopenic. I think that's BS. These blue zone type populations, they didn't go taking protein supplements as they got older. I think protein supplements are dangerous. There's been articles like in Consumer Reports saying these powdered protein supplements um, are associated with uh, 
Uh, a lot of times contaminants, like heavy metal contaminants, I would worry about them putting a person into kidney failure. I have seen some young guys, weightlifter guys, put themselves into kidney failure from uh, those protein supplements. I would also worry about the more you process a protein, make it into powder, you're going to increase the amount of ma manufactured free glutamate, breaking up the protein such that the individual uh, glutamate uh, amino acids are free now and can be absorbed like that. And I would worry about increasing the risk of uh, excitotoxicity effect from that because it's a, it's a brain stimulant. Okay, um, the other thing too, you know, we talked about uh, animals, these land animals get tons of proteins from eating plants, you know, a bull, an elephant, and lots of these other uh, plant-eating herbivore animals. So this idea that you can't grow big and strong on, on protein is uh, it's, it's nonsense. Okay, one quick thing about the difference in chemical structure of here's a carbohydrate, glucose, here's a fat, palmitate, C16, uh, with saturated fat, meaning that all the carbons are saturated with hydrogen. There's no double bonds in there. Okay, so what you see is that carbohydrate means carbon hydrated. Each carbon has an H2O on it. On this one, you only see one hydrogen, but that's because you got three hydrogens over here. So it adds up as being H2O water for every carbon, and thus it's already quite oxidized. There's a lot of oxygens in here, versus on a fat. This is all saturated with hydrogens. We don't draw the hydrogens in because it's obvious that's the only thing that could be there. So the reason I show this to you is this is very nonpolar, hydrophobic. And what that means is you could store it dry. You can store tons of fat dry. You don't need to add any water to it. Whereas something that's polar like this, and polar means that there's a big difference in electronegativity, desire to grab electrons. Oxygen really wants to grab electrons very strongly, uh, whereas carbon does not. So because of that, it's polar and it's soluble in aqueous solution. And a gram of glycogen is stored with, you know, in the ballpark of three grams of water. So it's wet. That means it's bulky. It's stored. You can only store about, you know, about a day and a half, two days of glycogen in your liver. And the liver is this giant thing. takes up, you know, about a third of your abdomen, okay? So I say that because... You can only store about a day and a half to two days worth of energy in glycogen in your liver, but you can store 60 days of energy if you were starving to keep you alive in fat around your body. And that's a person who's not even that fat. That would be just like a regular person, a big, real big fat, so would you know be able to live even longer. Okay, so that's one way you can tease a fat person. You say, well, if there's a famine, you're going to live longer than everybody else. Okay, so anyways, because it's more oxidized, the energy of of burning food comes from oxidizing it and then breaking apart the carbon-carbon bonds. And what I'm saying is that the glucose is already sort of halfway there, if you will. That's why you get more energy from the fat. Okay, here's an amino acid, and the unique thing about an amino acid, you know, for making protein is that there's a nitrogen. There's no nitrogen in the carbohydrate or in the fat we just showed. And the job of the kidney, the main thing the kidney does, about 75% of its energy in that ballpark is related to excreting nitrogen. So if you reduce dietary protein, you give the kidney a big vacation, and the kidney will be grateful to you for that. The structure of an amino acid, we talked about this, is just the alpha carbon in the center, and then an amino here for the amino and amino acid, an acid here for the acid and amino acid, a little hydrogen at the top, small little thing above, like a head. This is like the heart of a person or a thing. Then the R group is the variable down below, and you could abbreviate it just alpha R group because the R group is the only thing that changes between amino acids and I joke, I said, it, it reminds me of a crucifixion. So the alpha carbon is like the heart of Christ, sacred heart of Jesus. The H is like the head, the small part coming up from above the alpha carbon. Then you have the amino and the carboxylic acid here is the two, like where the two hands are. And then the variable is the R group down below, okay? And the peptide bonds form, you know, the two hands side to side there, okay? So you can imagine like, uh, you know, when Christ was on the cross, he had the... Uh, he had the good thief on his right-hand side. He had the bad thief on his left-hand side, forming a peptide bond here, a peptide bond here, if they were all amino acids. That's how that would work. Okay. Um, and the point I wanted to make about this stuff when I was talking about restricting individual amino acids. So if you eat the beans, they're, they got a pretty good amount of lysine, but they're low in methionine. This is showing how much lysine something has. This is showing how much methionine it has. If you talk about rice, it's going to be low in lysine, but it's going to be relatively higher in methionine. And the point that I was saying is, you know, back when T. Colin Campbell did his T. Colin Campbell did his experiments, he would feed maybe like just gluten as a protein, a single source, up to 20% of it. Or he would say feed just soy up to 20% of it. But what I'm saying is in a 
In the real world, we eat combinations of food. We often mix rice and beans together. So then we're going to have all the methionine from the rice. We're going to have all the lysine from the beans. And does that get to be a concern? And beans overall have lots of protein. Beans are about 30% of their calories from protein versus you know, rice is only about 7% of its calories from protein. So really not that much. Uh, but you can see what I'm getting at. If you're eating an OMAD diet, one meal a day, you're eating all this stuff together. Okay. And overall, though, there's just less protein, even with the beans, if you don't eat that much beans. But I wouldn't eat, you know, I try not to eat probably more than two cups at a time. And sometimes I do eat that myself just because it's convenient. Um, but you, you can see where this is going. Let's say I had cancer. Okay. I don't, I don't have any cancer. I'm totally healthy. I'm 60 years old, totally healthy. But let's say I did, I would want to reduce my protein intake. I would probably cut down on my beans. And I know Ruth Hydrich said that she did that. But you can also see here, I drew cancer kill zone from, from the meat because meat's high in everything, high in all the amino acids. It's high in lysine, it's high in methionine. You get them all at once, activate mTOR, okay? High in insulin like growth factor. Okay, um, here's an interesting guy. This is James R. Mitchell, PhD, Harvard Nutrition Researcher, really smart guy. Right at this YouTube channel here, it's called Buchinger Wilhelmi Clinic. Um, it's on YouTube. This lecture is about an hour long of his. Um, it's a very good lecture. And he talks about his research that also supported the idea that the best thing you could do to make animals live longer, and he predicts it's probably true of humans too, but it's been shown in animals, is to protein restrict. And you get the same benefits or more than you get from caloric restriction. Caloric restriction is not pleasant because it's, no, it's not fun to starve, okay? But protein restriction is relatively easy to do if you avoid one food, for example, that has a limiting amino acid. And the reason why I'm showing this and what I think was interesting about it was he talked about what he thinks is the mechanism for it. Okay, so what he says is when you protein restrict, what ends up happening is there's a bit of a shortage of amino acid availability for the liver to carry out a reaction pathway called gluconeogenesis, okay, to produce glucose. And he says because the liver doesn't have as, as many immediately available amino acids for gluconeogenesis, what it does is it starts breaking down dietary fat, breaking down fat, I'm sorry, from your fat tissue. Adipose is how you say the medical word for saying fat. Then breaking down fat is called lipolysis, you know, lipid, like lipid lysis. All right, well, this is where it gets interesting. A triglyceride, remember, is like a propene triol with three fatty acids sticking out from it, okay? So let me, let me maybe show that a little bit better here. So the, the propane trial would be like the back backbone. So imagine this green thing is the glycerol, okay? And then the three triglycerides would be the three fatty acids sticking out of the side of it, okay, if that makes any sense. Imagine I got three fatty acids there, okay, coming off of it. And so these three fatty acids would go to brown fat and be burned, but the glycerol would go to the liver, and it's a three-carbon molecule that can then enter glycolysis or can be converted you can use it for glucose type energy production. Okay, so the point was you want all those glycerols. And once you get those glycerols, you um, can burn those for energy. And you just, he says what's happening is they're just wasting the fatty acids. They send them to brown fat and they burn them for heat production. And it causes a person to lose weight. And he's a big fan. He thinks that Kempner showed that this is true and it works. Uh, so, anyways, I thought that was kind of interesting. A theory as to why protein restriction works. And then he also showed uh, several papers all showing that protein restriction increases longevity in animals. And these are some of the papers he talked about. And I just, you know, I have shown you here as well. Protein restriction was more important than caloric restriction uh, for life extension, according to this paper. Here's another paper in mice, 16% longer life when you had a low protein diet. And James Mitchell showed other experiments and papers where, and he also believes that's the case with the Okinawans when they're eating a low-protein diet. He believes that's a big part of why they live so long. It's been shown in mice and fruit flies and I think in some other animals too. And these are just graphs showing the longest-lived life for the fruit fly was low-protein, high-carbohydrate. Same thing for the mouse. The best longevity you could get was longest life, low-protein, high-carbohydrate. Anyways, his lecture is real good. If you just go to that Buchinger, Buchinger uh, clinic, you'll see it there, um, and those are some of the papers. So, anyways, um, I hope that was interesting and helpful.